what a beautiful day today. Uh, we want to take this time and I want to especially appreciate every father a happy Father's Day. And that includes even the grandfathers. You know, the Father's Day is celebrated in June and Mother's Day in May. But God created the fathers first. He created the Adam and then He created Eve. Mother is a symbol of sacrifice in the family, whereas the father is uh, the foundation of the family. He is like the ceiling, like a pillar of support uh, for the family. In the world, uh, we see Abraham is a father of faith and Job a father who prayed. And even God whom we worship, he calls himself as our Heavenly Father. And what a privilege that we are called to be his children. The role of a father is very special in the Bible. A father is the priest who prays for the family, a prophet who guides the family and the children. And he is the king who leads the family in the right way that is pleasing to God. And that is why uh, we need to pray for our fathers, we need to appreciate our fathers, and take this day to greet and bless the fathers. As we speak about fathers, we also remember those fathers who are single today. May the Lord give them strength. The fathers who are sick, may they be healed. And especially the fathers who are old, may the Lord grant them comfort. Today we especially appreciate the spiritual fathers. As Paul says, though you have 10,000 teachers, I have begotten you in the Lord. The spiritual fathers are great people in the body of Christ who guide God's children in the right way. What a blessing today. So take this day as you remember the Father, your Father, and may God bless all of our fathers. The Bible says, honor your father and your mother, that you may live long in the land that the Lord has given you. So it is imperative that we appreciate and honor our fathers that the families can be a blessed families which can shine for God's glory even in the days to come. So from FCC, the Farms of Compassion here, a very special Father's Day wishes to every father out there, every grandfather and every spiritual father. May God bless you richly. Dearly beloved, it is a joy to meet you even today. And for those of the fathers who are watching and the grandfathers, wishing you a very happy Father's Day all over. Uh, you are a blessing to your family and God has ordained you as a father. And I know you are blessed. And uh, <clears throat> we want to greet those of uh, the children today. Uh, God has given you fathers, so take time to, we want to remind you to appreciate your fathers and your grandfathers and your spiritual fathers too. Uh, so tell them how they have been a blessing to you and celebrate them with something special. Give them a special gift today. All right. Today I want to share with you about the seven traits of a godly father. The seven traits of a godly father. I want to pick from the lifetime of David and we're going to see a few fathers whom the Spirit of God showed me and we're going to learn some lessons. So this is going to be a great blessing, not only to the fathers, but 
to everyone, to would-be fathers, to grandfathers, to great-grandfathers, and even for the rest of the family, that you can uh, pray for your fathers to have these traits. And if they already have, you can thank God. Number one is a father who shows no partiality. And this is the life of Jesse, the father of David. Now, because of time, I'm going to quote a few verses. And uh, I want you to make note of them. And if you can read it later, it'll be good. I'll read the verses that I can contain in this time. 1 Samuel chapter 16. We see... The prophet Samuel being sent by God to the house of Jesse in Bethlehem. And he wanted to organize his sacrifice and then get the sons of Jesse that he could appoint or anoint one of them to be the king of Israel. What an honor to the house of Jesse. So Samuel asked Jesse to bring the sons and uh, Jesse, for some reason, I don't know, he brought seven sons because totally he had eight. And Samuel was going from one to another thinking that this is the one. And God said, no, I don't look at his face. I look at the heart. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, nobody. Then in verse 11, and Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet the youngest, and there he is keeping the sheep. Now look at that. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. Children of God, if God spoke through Samuel the prophet to bring Jesse's children, Jesse should have brought all of his sons. <laughs> he had eight sons and he was the father of all the eight. Why should he have seven leave the one uh, tending the sheep? He should have sent somebody to get David. But Samuel had to push Jesse to do that. Now, th this is a problem of partiality. As a father... It's very important that no father should give room to partiality. You know, partiality can bring a big damage in the, in the emotional, in the minds of children and destroy the family. We see how Isaac, though he was a godly man, he had an issue when his wife Rebecca conceived twins. She went to inquire God. God said, "The eldest shall, or the elder shall serve the younger." So what Isaac did for some reason supported the elder, and the wife Rebecca supported the younger. So it was like two kingdoms in the same house. Now. You might say, oh, it is God who said the elder will serve the younger. Now, God said it. It's true. But what God meant by that, the elder will receive the blessing through the younger. You know, it's, it's just that. It doesn't mean God was bringing in partiality. Never. And we know all the problems that happened because of that partiality. That... Esau goes to the extent of being so angry to kill Jacob and Jacob cheating his brother. All because of partiality. A whole family had a lot of trouble. And that is why I believe when Jacob had 12 sons, he never had partiality for any of those 12 sons. He loved all of them. And he spoke a word of blessing on all of them in Genesis 49. Very important. First Peter 1.17 tells us that our father is a father who has no partiality. He judges every one of his children according to their works and rewards them. 
Now, though David was treated with partiality, when David came in, God spoke to Samuel and Samuel anointed David as the king of Israel. And later on, when David was running for his life from Saul, 1 Samuel 22 verse 1, we read that David's father's house, David's father, his mother, and the brothers and their families, they came to David. Now, what would you do in a situation like that? You've been treated partially, but now those who treated you partially are coming to you for refuge. You know what David did? First Samuel 22 verse 3 tells us that David goes to the king of Moab, where he was at that moment, and asks the king for refuge for his father and his mother. What a beautiful uh, response David had. So number one, a father who shows no partiality. Number two, a father who looks into the good in others, which means his children, his wife, his family. So a godly father looks into the good. We're going to take the example of Saul. Now, when Goliath the Philistine came against Israel, David put his life on the line, fought with Goliath, by the power of God, defeated him. So when David was now the conqueror, the reward was Saul's daughter will be given to him as a wife and he'll be given special position. So that was the reward which was announced earlier. And now David was brought by Saul into the capital, into the city. All the women were singing. Saul has slain thousand, but David at ten thousand. So this song of praise, when uh, Saul heard it, <laughs> he got angry. Saul could have actually seen the good in David. He could have seen, oh, this guy, this young fellow, he put his life at risk and he fought for the country and now he is a great asset to me. He could have appreciated David. You know, Saul was like a father figure and David was so young. But the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 9, that Saul eyed David from that day forward. In other words, Saul was jealous or viewed with suspicion. And verse 12, Saul was afraid of David. Now you see, instead of seeing the good in David, Saul started seeing David as his competitor. Now, how sad it is that Saul not only treated David in a bad way, he also treated his own son, Jonathan, who had good words concerning David. You know, Jonathan was a good man. And uh, First Samuel 19 verse 4 tells us that uh, Jonathan spoke good words concerning David to his father Saul. What a different person he is. His father could not see the good in David, but though David was not evil in any way, but Jonathan, Saul's son, could see the good in David and spoke good words. So, so that means uh, when we see the good in somebody, we speak good words. It's very important. In our family, we learn to appreciate a father's words of appreciation concerning his children, his child. When a father can say, you know, I like the way you dress, I like the way you eat, I like the way you sing, I like the way you walk. When a father talks to that child like that, I like the way you do this, you do that. Words of appreciation, words of love. Very powerful. And that's exactly what our Heavenly Father does. He appreciates us. 
He looks at us as sons and daughters, though we are in no way worthy of his love. Isn't it amazing? A godly father always looks at the good in his wife, in his in his children, and he speaks. But as we see in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 30, Saul spoke such bad words concerning his own son, Jonathan. I don't want to read it now, you know. I would rather want you to read it because, oh, it's, it's very painful. You know, he was literally, and the Bible records literally, Saul was not only speaking words against Jonathan, but against Jonathan's mother, that is his own wife. What a sad thing it is. Let's remember, as a godly father, may we see the good in others and speak good words. Never swear cuss words. Number three, a godly father has a good testimony. And that is the life of Samuel the prophet. So we saw number one, Jesse. Number two, Saul. Number three, Samuel. And all these people lived in the time of David. For Samuel chapter 12, verses 3 and 4. Now Samuel was quite old and he was the last judge who judged Israel. And now he was retiring. So he made all the people of Israel to stand and he was giving his farewell speech. What did he say? Here I am, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken or whose donkey have I taken? Or, whose, or whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? Or, whom, or from whose hand have I received any bribe with which to blind my eyes? I will restore it to you. And they said, you have not cheated us or oppressed us. Nor have you taken anything from any man's hand. Clean life. People gave a clean shit. And that is testimony. Whether in the, in the family or at workplace or in the church or in the society, we should have a clean testimony. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. And now that, that's the kind of life we have to live. Samuel lived above reproach. And that means a clean life as a father, as a godly father. You need to think, can my wife, can my children close their eyes and follow my life? Am I living such a life of a good example. This is Christianity. Christianity is not taking the guitar and singing, jumping, shouting. No. Living out a life that is a testimony. Some people have a great reputation all over, you know, in the workplace. Everybody speaks good about them. At home, Oh, it is a, it's a different story altogether. We have to ask, can my wife, can my children speak good things about me, behind me? Can they follow my life? Paul was writing to the church in Corinth and he said, follow me even as I follow Christ. What a father he was, a spiritual father. Good testimony. Number four, a father who realizes God's grace. Now we come to the life of David, 2 Samuel chapter 7. I want to give you three verses, verses 18, 20, and 21. Now David was made to be a king. He had a humble beginning as a shepherd boy, but now he was literally the king of all Israel, and Saul and the family have died. God has elevated him. What did David do? 
verse 18. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord. That is in the, what do you call this, the sanctuary, the, the tent of meeting. Because there was no temple at that time. And he said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me this far? So David goes, he sits down on the floor. And he says, Who am I, Lord? You know. And, and later on, if we, if we read verse 20 and 21. In fact, I want you to read from verse 19. Let me read from verse 19. And yet this was a small thing in your sight, O Lord God. And you have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. Is this the manner of man, O Lord God? You see, David was calling his family your servant's house. He said, I'm your servant. I'm just your servant. I'm nothing more than a servant. You know, he was not bragging about himself. Today, what we, what we see in social media and this and that, oh, Sometimes some people who call themselves as God's servants, they come online, they are bragging about themselves, about the properties they have, the cars they buy. Who wants all those things? It's nothing. It's nothing. David had everything. He did not brag about what he had. He bragged about God. And he said, who am I, Lord? I'm just, I'm just your servant. He recognized that it is your grace. It is your grace. Whatever I have, whatever I am, whatever I've received is your grace. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Verse 20. Now what more can David say to you? For you, Lord God, know your servant. He says again, you servant. That word comes again and again throughout this chapter 7. Your servant, your servant, your servant. He says, I'm your servant. I'm just that. It is your grace. It's about you. It's not about me. It's about you. It's not about me. May we realize the grace of God. We are nothing without that. Verse 21, for your word's sake and according to your own heart, you have done all these great things to make your servant know them again. Lord, you did it because you promised it. You did it because you wanted it to happen. Who am I? I'm just a product of your grace. You see, this kind of a realization of God's grace made David to humble. He went and sat at the feet of God. You know, my father used to tell the story when we were growing up. His grandfather was a retired uh, official from the railways. And um, they used to live in Dindakal, which is a town, by the way, about 100 kilometers from where uh, we are there right now, where I am talking. So my father, when he was a child, they used to go, all the grandkids used to go to uh, the grandparents' place. And early in the morning, before it was dawn, there used to be a voice singing a beautiful hymn. A beautiful hymn about seeking God early in the morning. Every day, the same song. <laughs> what a blessing. People who have not realized the grace of God will be, are the ones who will say, I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to read the Bible. I am busy. I am this and that. If you're saying that, that just means you are saying, I don't care about the grace of God. I tell you, that's a dangerous place to be. Anybody who realizes it is by your grace I live will always take time every day. Sit at the feet of Jesus. In the morning, pray and read the word and ask God, God, your grace has led me this far. Give me grace for today. I can't make it on my own. As a godly father who recognizes the grace of God. Number five. A godly father repents and realigns with God. Again, David... When he got to a place in 2 Samuel 11, 
there was a bit of a shakiness. He lost his focus. When it was time for war, he should have gone to, to fight. The Bible says that uh, he got caught in an act of sin. And uh, he committed adultery. Then on top of that, he, he lied. And he killed a man, one of his faithful generals by name Uriah. And uh, God was upset with David. God sent his prophet to convict David of his sin. When the prophet came and told David, even though David was king, the prophet said, you have done this, 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 and the consequence is going to be this, this, this. It's going to, the sword will not leave your family, nor your generation. Second Samuel 12 verse 13. What was the response of David? You know, there are times when we can, when we may fail. We are just human beings. We need to search our hearts and, and repent and come back to God. Set your relationship with God straight. Second Samuel twelve thirteen. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. That was a plain confession. He didn't hide it. He didn't try to give excuses. Oh, that is because I, you know, like Saul was good at giving excuses. That's the problem. Why God removed Saul? <laughs> He did not accept his fault. He always had some excuse. May we never give excuses when we are at mistake. When we have wronged, when David was wrong, he said, I'm wrong. Psalm 51 is a psalm that he wrote, a psalm of confessing his sin and asking God to be merciful upon him. And in that psalm he says, Lord, I have done this against you. And he asked God to cleanse him. What did God do? For Samuel 12 verse 13, the second part. And Nathan said to David, The Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. <laughs> because David repented, realigned with God. God accepted him. God was merciful to him. And for that matter, David did another mistake again later on in his life to count the army or to count the men. And God was angry because David was trying to see how strong he was, not realizing the grace of God was the one that has kept him till that time. And the prophet again came and gave him three choices. Of chastening and David did not choose anything. He said in Second Samuel twenty four fourteen, may we fall into the hands of the Lord, his mercies are great. He was quick to repent and to reconnect with God. And that's the sign, that's the trait of a godly father. What an amazing thing. If a father is that way, his children are going to follow the same way. They'll be good in keeping their relationship with God. Number six, a godly father is clear in fulfilling priorities according to God's plan. Again, in the life of David, when he was in his deathbed, there was a lot of confusion because already one of his sons, Absalom, had made a huge problem saying that he was the king. Then later on, another son, created a lot of trouble. Then later on, Adonijah was creating trouble and David was in his last days. So the prophet Nathan comes and tells Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, he tells God's plan is your son should be the next king. So you go and talk to King David. And when she went and spoke to King David, her husband Nathan the prophet came and he also approved it, he confirmed it. And David was not confused. He said, I will do what God's plan is. He made Solomon as the next king. First Kings chapter 1 verses 29 and 30. 
You know, I, I know of some fathers or some parents who become old and they do not settle the things that they need, need to settle, especially if they have properties, they don't write the will, they don't make the settlement properly, so... And they die one fine day, leaving the children to just quarrel, fight and, and divide and go to court and this and that. All because lack of wisdom. And where does wisdom come from? Wisdom comes from the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Recently, I was visiting an old lady who had lost her husband. In fact, her husband never contributed anything for her life. She came up from a poor background, brought up three daughters, got them married, she accepted Christ, her daughters accepted Christ. God blessed her with a property. And you know what she said when she looked at me? She said, she started weeping, saying, Pastor, the Lord has brought you today. I said, why are you crying? She said, I wanted to write a will, a, a will to, to allocate different parts of my property to my daughters. Is that right? Is that okay? I said, when I heard what she was saying, I felt that what she was saying was right and doing things the right way. I said, well done. Please do it and do it soon. When God has given you life and health and strength, this is the time to do your priorities the right way so that there be no confusion later on. Hmm. How many people I know, even after accepting Christ, they are not clear about their priorities. It's not about money. It's not about wealth. It's about being fair. And that's a godly father. Finally, a godly father wants to build the kingdom of God. And that was the heart of David. He always wanted to build the temple. But God said, because your hands are filled with blood, you have been a warrior, you will not. But your son will build it. So in First Chronicles chapter 22, verses 11, 14 and 19, David amasses a lot of gold, silver, bronze, stones, iron. And he tells his son, come on, get up and build it. But I want to read you a couple of verses, you know, a verse which really tells us the heart of David. And that's given in First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 10. Wow, this is a beautiful verse. It says, Consider now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Wow. That's powerful, you know. He was telling his son, son Solomon, you have not been chosen to just be a king. That is not your prime thing. You are chosen to be a king so that you can build the temple of God. So building God's temple is your priority. Now, being a king is your tool to build a temple. What an amazing understanding is that? Putting God first. Father, God wants you to put him first. He wants you to teach your children, his, your family, to put God first. Amen. And that means, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 60, Solomon caught that revelation and when he built the temple and he was praying, he said, Lord, that the people of all the earth will know that you are God and nobody else. And that's why this temple has been built, because you will answer prayer. So building the kingdom of God means letting people know that Jesus is Lord and Jesus saves, bringing others to the love of Christ. When we were growing up, my father, he was a marketing representative. That means a salesperson for buses and trucks. And um, anytime 
when somebody visits our house, children, we children would be inside the room and we'll be here, parents talking and my father will start suddenly somewhere to start sharing the gospel with that person. He'll tell his testimony always with everybody who, who came to our house. And if we went somewhere, he would do the same thing. And I would be wondering, why does my father do this always? <laughs> Doesn't he know any other story except the story of Jesus? <laughs> but now I know. I realized it somewhere down in my life that that is the reason God has chosen us. Whether you are an engineer, doctor, whether you are a banker, whether you are a marketing person, computer person, household worker, whoever you are, the ultimate in life is God has chosen you to share the gospel. What a blessing it is. And these are the seven traits of the godly father. I believe that God has blessed you today and I know that as you pick these things up, let me tell you the seven things once again. Number one, a godly father shows no partiality. Number two, he looks into the good in others and speaks it. Number three, godly father has a good testimony. Number four, he realizes the grace of God in his life. Number five, a godly father repents and realigns with God. Number six, a godly father fulfills priorities according to God's plan. And number seven, a godly father, his heart is to build the kingdom of God. May we commit ourselves, you know, if you are a father, it's, it's great to commit yourself to this. And even if you're anybody else, a mother or a young person, an older person, still these words hold good for each of us. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for calling us your children because of what Jesus did on the cross for us 2,000 years ago. Thank you, Lord, for shedding your blood that as we believe in your blood, we are made your own children, Lord. You're a father to the fatherless, and I pray for every father who has listened to these words. May these words strengthen them and become reality in their lives. And for every other person, may these words bring forth strength. And I pray anybody who is a fatherless person, you will be their father and guide and provide and protect. We thank you for your heard us. Thank you, Lord. The Lord is showing me a vision right now. And I see that you're watching this message and you've been hearing it, but... In your heart, there's a troubling situation and, and you feel, who will do it for me? Who will help me? Who will solve that problem for me? God says, I'm there for you. Trust me. God is telling you right now. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that something will happen right now, even as I'm praying right now. You will work it out for your children. God of restoration. God who seeks and saves that which is lost. Thank you for doing it. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. What a joy to get to you online. And it's been a blessing to me sharing it's a joy to me to see you blessed and i know uh, many who have been blessed through these messages have been commenting in the chat and letting us know like recently there was somebody who shared with me a testimony uh, who said they called up our office to say that there was a time a couple of years back this family had lost everything lost the business and sinking in debt in a mire of debt and i remember when they called up, we I prayed with them, spoke God's word upon them. Just a couple of days, in fact, yesterday, this family called up and said, God has delivered us completely. Our business is up and running again. And uh, we want to glorify God. We want to send the testimony. We want to send the offering. 
it is an amazing miracle. Our God is alive. Today, he has spoken that he is there to fight for you. He will work out for you. So be encouraged, be blessed. And if you're blessed, please share this message with somebody. Share. Click the share button in the YouTube and share it through WhatsApp or Facebook or any media, Instagram, whatever it is. Or send it via email. Let somebody, may, may, a godly, may a godly father arise, may some father whom you know and you think this message will be a blessing to them, please send it and bless them. I'll see you again in the week to come. Amen.